I am back and I'm continuing to work through these Feynman lecture exercises uh, posted on Caltech's website. Uh, so I will include a link to all of the problems down below. I have, I have not really looked at these other than to print them out, uh, so I'm working on them from scratch. Also, I should point out that there are indeed solutions posted on the website down below. Uh, I have not looked at those. Um, I want to, to try to see if I can solve these myself without looking at those. Um, also down below, you will find a link to the playlist with all of my solutions in there so far. So I'm working through them in this order. So I've gotten through all of these. That one, that one, that one, that one. I'm right there, I'm on bouncing ball. Okay, and so some of these some of these are really interesting problems and you should check them out and try to solve them yourself. And in fact, that's what I would probably recommend. I'd recommend going to uh, the Feynman Lecture site and uh, trying to solve these problems yourself. Okay, and so th these are all different, submitted by different uh, people. Um, so let's just jump into this next problem called bouncing ball. Okay, a small solid rubber ball of radius R is thrown against a rough horizontal floor, so here's the floor, uh, such that its velocity just before striking the floor at A, so right there, is V. The vector is going down that way. It has a uh, so that angle is 60 degrees. It also has a backspin of angular velocity omega. So it's spinning, there's a little arrow right there, so it's spinning this way. So it's moving this way, spinning that way. I guess it's only backspin because it spins in the opposite direction of the horizontal direct. Well, that's kind of makes sense. It's observed that the ball bounces from A to B and then B to A. So it bounces back and forth assuming perfectly elastic impact. Determine the required magnitude of omega of the backspin in terms of V and R and the minimum coefficient of static friction to enable this motion. Okay, this is kind of, kind of strange. Let's just, I'm not really sure what's going on here, so let's just, let's just jump right into it. That's what you should always do. If you're not sure what to do, then just do something, right? Okay, so here I have this. There's the ground. And I know, let me draw the ball right before. So there's my ball right before it impacts, and I'll call this V1 vector. And then, so I know the, I know the angles and stuff like that. Uh, and then also I know uh, this is, what was it? Yeah, this way. This is omega one. And then right after the impact, I'll actually draw a little line right here. So here's my floor. Right after the impact, it's going to be going in the direct opposite direction, V2. Wait. Yes. I think that's true. And then it's going to be spinning the opposite direction, omega2. So I'm going to assume that uh, omega1 magnitude equals omega 2 magnitude. I mean, if it goes back and forth the whole time, that I think that has to be true. I think that has to be true. I definitely, the, I'm, okay, the, I'm not 100% sure about the angular velocity being exact opposite. The, the, the vertical velocity has to change. I'm pretty sure, yeah, because it, otherwise, if it's not launching with the same but opposite velocity, then it's not going to end up back at the other spot. And then if it doesn't do it again, it's not going to end up back over here. Okay, so I'm going to assume that. Now I'm also going to say V1 magnitude equals V2 magnitude. Okay, so there's an impact with the, with the ground. During that impact, it looks like this. So here's the ball. Uh, so there's three forces acting on it. There's the downward gravitational force, Mg. There's the upward normal force, uh, N. And then there's a friction force. Let's see, so if the ball is rotating this way, I think the friction force is going to be that way. It has to be, yeah. It has to be that way in order to get this thing to, to go off in that direction, right? Because it was moving this way, and then later it's moving that way. So you have to have a force pushing in that direction to change its momentum that way. I have a feeling that we're going to have to ignore the gravitational force. Um, but let's just, let's just proceed. Okay, so... 
what do I know about these forces? I know Since I know the velocities before and after, I can write the following. F net, the net force is delta P over delta T. This is the momentum principle. This says this is going to be P2 minus P1 over delta T, where P is mass times velocity. So P1 is mass times velocity 1, P2 is mass times velocity 2. Now, I also know something similar. I don't know delta T, but I do know an expression for P1 and P2. And, yeah, maybe it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm thinking about the gravity still. So. so then also what about the angular velocity? Well, if this is fixed in uh, an axis of rotation so that it's rotating about an axis going in and out of the paper like that, which I assume would be true, then I can write the scalar version of the angular momentum principle. Uh, it says that the net torque about some point O is going to be equal to uh, delta L over delta T. And again, that's a scalar version. So in this case, I want that in terms of uh, angular momentum. So I can write this as uh, I omega 2 minus I omega 1 over delta T. So I is the moment of inertia of a sphere, and delta T is the same delta T, and I think that is key. Okay, so let's just write this in terms of the y direction for this equation right here. So if I look at the, the y, for, and let me do this. So they, they have this, do they want that in terms of the angle 660? No. Okay, so let's write this as, oh, let's do the y direction. So f net y is going to be n minus mg, and that's going to be p2, which is m v2 y, which is going to be v, the y component at the end is going to be this angle is, no wait, yeah, this angle is 60 degrees. So the y component uh, at the end is also going to be 60 degrees. That's 60. So this is going to be the sine. So it's going to be v times the sine of 60. That's the y component right there of v2. Minus the initial velocity, momentum, which is going to be m v sine 60, but this is a negative one, so that's going to be minus a negative, so that's plus. And then all of that over delta t. So I get, uh, this is going to be, uh, so sine of 60, was that 2? Clear. Sine 60. Is that in rate? I'm in degrees. Okay, so let's just say that's going to be, was it square root of 3 over 2. Let's just leave it as sine 60. So it's going to be 2 m v sine 60 over delta t. Okay, now I don't know n. I don't, I do know m. Did they want it in terms of the mass? The v and r. Okay, so I don't know m. That's fine. Okay, now let's do the x direction. So in the x direction, I only have the frictional force uh, F, F, and that's going to be equal to the change in X momentum. So in this case, the initial X momentum, the final X momentum is going to be uh, M, V, cosine 60 in the positive direction, minus initial, which is going to be plus, minus the negative, M, V, cosine 60. All of that over delta T. So this is going to be uh, 2 M, V, and cosine 60 is a half. Right, that one's a half. Why am I? Sometimes you just do dumb stuff, you know, and that's fine. Yeah, that is a half. So that's going to be a half. That's going to cancel that. So it's going to be mv over delta t. And so I know, I still don't know delta t. I don't know n. I don't know the friction force. I don't know delta t. Um, now, whew, I feel like I'm getting off track here. This one is kind of tough. You know, it's, it's one of those cases where you just start writing down things you know and you hope you see something. I'm trying to find omega. So let's just, let's just, let's just solve for omega. Okay, so I'm gonna get a new piece of paper right here. So I'm just gonna take this. Now I know that if it's a sphere, I is two fifths m 
r squared. That's the moment of inertia of the sphere. It's constant. Uh, I also know that um, one of these, see, if, if I take the z direction as positive angular velocity, then this would be negative, and that would be positive. So, but, but the thing is that these two are going to add up to a factor of 2. So I have this. Torque net equals, oh, I see something. It's going to be 2 times 2 fifths m r squared times omega over delta t. Now, if I think about this, here's my sphere, and here's my friction force, and that's the radius r, then I can actually get an expression for the torque. So I get r f, they're perpendicular to each other, equals, um, I guess I should say this is 4 fifths m r squared omega. I'm not worried about the sign delta t. Okay, now let's get, let's write this as r times f f delta t equals 4 fifths m r squared omega. Because I see that and I go back over here and I have delta t times friction is mv. Delta t friction, that's a t. F friction delta t equals mv. Okay, so I can put that in over here for that and I get r mv equals 4 fifths m r squared omega. The ma oh, I got it. The masses cancel and I get, no, that's just r squared, om not omega squared. So now I can, and this r cancels with that, so I get omega equals uh, 5 fourths v over r. And it does have the right units, right? So that's meters per second divided by meters gives me 1 over seconds. So I I feel like that could be the right answer, at least have the right units. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really feel too happy about it because I'm not really sure how you would get something to bounce back exactly based on that angular velocity. It just, it just doesn't, it's not vibing with me. I mean, the, everything, the math works out, but it's just not, it's just not gelling in my head. Does that make sense? Okay. The second question was, what is the minimum coefficient of static friction? Okay. So let's say, um, if, if it's just about to slip, then I can say the friction force is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So I want to solve for that. So that's going to be mu s equals friction divided by n. Uh, okay, so now up here I had n and friction. I could divide these two, but see that the mass is not going to cancel. Okay, so I, I, I feel like, because I've done this before, I feel like that if the time interval is really short, this change in momentum is not going to have a big impact from the gravitational force. I'm going to just let that go away which I don't feel happy about. Okay, I'm not happy about that at all. I, sometimes you do things you're not happy about just because you were trying to make people happy. So I'm not happy, but I'm going to do it. So if that's the case, then I can take, I can just take this and divide by that, and that should be the coefficient of friction. So let me write those two things. Oh, let's just write it out. So mu s equals the friction force, which is this, mv over delta t, divided by this, which is going to be 1 over that stuff. So it's going to be delta t over 2mv sine 60. Okay, so the delta t is canceled. That's good. Mass cancels. So I get the coefficient of static friction. And again, remember, I want a quick point. This, this is really what it looks like. So it can be any value, but uh, we're looking at this part where it's at the at the maximum. So we're looking for the minimum coefficient. Uh, so what am I up here? V over, or oh, the V's cancel. So I get 1 over 2 sine 60. Okay. Well, I mean, I like that because the coefficient of friction should have no units. This is Newton's, that's Newton's, so that can't have any units. And this doesn't have a unit, so those are my two answers. I'm gonna. I don't know that these two are right. I don't feel 100% confident in them, but uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna submit these as my final answer, and hope that I at least get some partial credit. 
Okay, so again, the playlist down below. Uh, try to do these problems yourself. Um, I'm going to keep working some more of these problems because I'm having a good time. Uh, and see you in the next problem.